All right, it's great to be here this morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I cannot convey to you enough how excited I am to preach this sermon. All right, I've been working on it all week. It's been stirring in me, and I'm fired up, all right? So I just want you to know that right now. Buckle up, because we might be here for a while. All right, this, today we're going to look at one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. Everybody here probably knows this story. If I ask every kid, if I walked back to the, uh, the kids program today and I ask them this story, they'd all know this story. We're going to talk about the story of David and Goliath. Everybody knows that story, right? One of, but the problem is over this years, I mean, it, it kind of all through the history, from the time I was a little kid, this story has kind of captured our imagination. It's been immortalized in a number of movies. For instance, here I've, I went back and looked at a couple. Of, I hope they come up on the screen. There you go. Uh, the movie just came out uh, last year called I Will Do It. I didn't see it. I don't know what it's like. Orson Welles played Saul uh, in David and Goliath back in the 60s. There's been a number of movies made about it. Of course, who can forget the next one? This is probably the most famous rendition of David and Goliath. Made by the Veggie Tales, David and the Giant Pickle, which for the life of me, I've never understood. I think I understand Apocalypse Now better than I understood Davy and the Giant Pickle. But anyways, one of the problems that we have when we come to this story, and I kind of use those to illustrate this. We know this story so well that we think we understand it. And honestly, what has happened in the church, this story has morphed into something along this line. It's a story about how to be a champion for God, but that's not what the story is about. This is not a story about how you can defeat giants in your life. This is a story about Jesus. This is a story that points us to the need for a Savior. And I'm going to show that to you as we go along. So what I want you to do today is pretend that you have never heard this story uh, before. And then I want us, as we go through the Scripture, to pay very close attention to the details of the story. I want us to really kind of pay attention to what the Bible is saying and then try to fit that in to the grand storyline of the Bible. Try to fit it in to how it fits to the rest of Scripture. So for a moment, I've got to remind you about where we are at in this story. Over the last number of weeks, we've been working our way through the book of 1 Samuel. And up until this point, sort of the primary personality that we've been dealing with in this, path, in this book has been King Saul. And you'll remember that King Saul had, had become king for all of the wrong reasons. The Bible makes it very clear. What happened was Israel wanted to be like the other nations around them. They looked around, all the other nations had a king. By the way, they were facing a moment of crisis. There was an Ammonite king that had raised up that was sort of kind of powerful, a guy named Nahash, and they were very worried that they were going to be attacked. And so they wanted to have a king like all of the nations around them. So they went to Samuel, and they said, Samuel, give us a king so that we'll be like everybody else. Now, the problem with this is this was totally driven not by faith but by sight. They were looking at the circumstances, they were looking at what's going around them, and they picked the wrong guy. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear. Samuel, the prophet, who they go to and ask them to appoint the king, is kind of upset because Samuel feels like they've kind of rejected him. He'd been the voice piece of God to the people for a number of years, and, and now they want a king, and he feels kind of dejected by the whole thing. But God makes something very clear. He says, Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. See, God had been their leader. He had been their ruler. And now they were saying, we really don't want that. We really want a man to stand in the place, and we want him to be our ruler. And you know what happens. Saul is an utter disaster. And so last week, we looked at how the decision that God made to replace Saul. Again, Saul had been the people's choice. He was the people's champion. He was the tallest guy. He came from a, a, a wealthy family. He was the guy that attracts the, the attention of people. But David was God's choice. And that made all of the difference. And so uh, this week, I want to begin to look at, at some of the early things that happened in David's career. Now, approximately, 
And this is kind of a a guesstimate, to be very honest with you. Bible scholars don't know how much time went between chapter 16 and chapter 17 of the book of 1 Samuel. Some have suggested numerous years. Others have suggested maybe about a year. What's very clear is a period of time has gone by. There has been a brief time when David actually served in the household of Saul, uh, but that has ended. David is back raising his father's sheep. Saul is out kinging, doing the things that kings do, getting ready for a great battle. And it seems like the two haven't crossed paths for a number or for a while. In fact, Saul doesn't even seem to recognize David anymore. So a period of time is going by, maybe a year, maybe two, I don't know, but a period of time has gone by. And I want you to see what begins to happen. Again, the forces of the Philistines have come out to fight the Israelites. Now, you know As I told you a few weeks ago, the Philistines are a constant source of problems for the nation of Israel back in that day. The problem with these folks are they live right on the coastline bordering the nation of Israel. They're a very mobile people, and they're a very motivated people. They are people that want to conquer other nations. They want to set up trading posts. And so... By nature, the Philistines just keep showing up in Israel and creating havoc. And so in the first few verses, we see once again what the situation is. Look in verses 1 through 3. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokah, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokah and Azekah in the Aphes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, uh, uh, gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. So look what begins to happen here. The Philistines, by the way, are brilliant, brilliant soldiers. And what they do is as they come into Israel, they take up an extremely strategic spot. In fact, I put a map up here, uh, not a map, but a picture of this valley so that you can see it. And uh, if you'll notice what happens here is this is just a wide open valley. That valley there is called the Valley of Elah. And you can see the map. Saul's camp is on top of one mountain. And over on the other side is where the Israelites camped out. And you see that roadway that runs down through there, that road is essentially built on an ancient road that would have ran right through that area when Saul and David were alive. And the reason that is important is because look what happens. The Philistines build, take this army, and they want to control that road. They want to control trade. So they build their army up right along that road. And the Israelites come in, by the way, I'm sorry, and camp on that south uh, end of the camp, and they come cut off the road back to uh, Philistia. That's important because here's what it shows. Saul doesn't want to fight. Saul takes up a defensive position along the road going back to Philistia, and basically what he's saying to do is there's no retreat. You're stuck in my territory. I don't want to have to fight you. Why don't you just walk on back home? (laughs) That's what Saul's trying to indicate with the position that he takes up. But the problem is Fear begins to overtake the Israelites because the Philistines have a new weapon. Do you remember back during the uh, beginning of the Gulf War back in the late 90s, early 2000s? Do you remember we had this thing they called the shock and awe weapons? You remember that when we, when we attacked Iraq? They would drop these big bombs that had a lot of pyrotechnics and they'd make a really big show. We called them shock and awe. Goliath is the original shock and awe weapon. Let me show you what happens in verse 4. In verse 4 down through verse 11, look what happens. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion. Now, you got to know what that word champion means for a moment. The word champion literally means a man between the two. And basically what happens here, as you're going to see this in just a moment, is sometimes armies 
when they didn't really want to have to have a big loss of life, the one army would send out a champion, the other army would send out a champion, those two would fight in single combat, and they would determine the outcome of the war. That's what Goliath is. He's going to come walking out, he's a champion, the man in between, he's going to walk out into the middle of the Elah Valley, and he's going to shout to the, to, uh, uh, Jew, the, the, the Israelite camp, Send out somebody to fight me. And you notice what happens. Look in verse number, uh, end of number four there. He said, the Philistines were, uh, uh, came out from the camp of the Philistines, a champion named Goliath of Gath. Now look at this. Sir. His height was six cubits and a span. That's about nine and a half feet tall. All right? He had, he, um, <laughs> this is amazing. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And, when, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like the weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, I want you to see what happens here. Again, Goliath is like the original shock and awe weapon. He is nine foot nine inches tall. And by the way, let me give you an example of how tall that is. I got a picture up here of the world's record tallest man. This old boy was named Robert Wood Wadlow. He was eight feet, 11 inches tall. Saul's almost a foot taller than him, or uh, De uh, Goliath is almost a foot taller than him. This is a giant of a man, all right? Goliath comes out, and, and he begins to uh, demand that people come out to fight. Not only is he big, not only is he the biggest guy, by the way, the average Israelite is just over five foot tall at that day and age. Saul was taller. He was a head and shoulders taller than the average Israelite. We know the average Israelite was just a little over five foot tall in that day. Saul was about six foot tall. He is dwarfed by Goliath, and he's the biggest guy in Israel. Saul's the biggest guy in Israel. So this guy is, not only that, he's massively armored. When, when Goliath comes out, he has all of the latest technology for fighting a battle. He has a bronze helmet, all right? He has a coat of mail that weighed 5,000 shekels. That means his armor, the chain mail that he wore, was 126 pounds. Now, by the way, you got to be a man to carry around 126 pounds of chain armor, all right? I mean, come on. You, you know, you just strap 50 pounds around you and carry it around for a little while and you're worn out. There's 126 pounds of chain mail that he's got around him. Then he's got bronze armor on his legs and he's got this javelin. The, the word javelin here, by the way, doesn't mean what we think it means. The actual Hebrew word would be better translated scimitar. It is a long, curved sword. All right? And he straps that bad boy across his back. This guy looks like Rambo coming out. All right? He got, he's got a sword strapped around his back. Then he's got a spear, and the tip of the spear weighs, well, how much? 120-some shekels. All right? And, and uh, I have that weight there somewhere. Uh, it, that's about a 15-pound spearhead. I'm going to tell you a little secret, guys. You get hit by a 15-pound spearhead, this is going to do a little damage, all right? This, this is a monster, all right? This is, this is, when the Israelites look at it, they've never seen anything that big. Here he is. He's glistening in the sunlight. All that bronze is shining. They're looking at his weaponry going, we don't have anything like that. And Israel's going to fight him, by the way, basically with sticks and stones. That's basically what they have in that day. They don't have iron. They don't have all the kind of stuff that they need to fight with. And so all, all of a sudden, he comes out and he begins to engage in psychological warfare. He's going to psych them out. 
You ever seen guys come out on a sporting thing? They begin to psych each other out. They begin to talk trash. They begin, uh, my brother-in-law and I were watching Notre Dame yesterday, and we were, we were reminiscing about a um, number of years ago, Notre Dame was playing Michigan, and they were coming out the same tunnel. And normally what they want the teams to do is one come out and then the other team come out. Well, that year what happened, they all crowded into the tunnel at the same time. And, uh, and uh, you, know, no, you know, Michigan started their typical, you know, weird stuff, you know, acting tough. And, uh, and so they started shouting stuff at the Irish, and the Irish started shouting stuff be up about them. And they're just, they're trading these barbs. Goliath comes out. He's going to psych out the, Phil- the Israelite army. Walks out in the middle of the battlefield. Come on. I come here to fight. You come here to fight. Send somebody down to fight me. And he makes him an offer. Hey, we'll, we'll wage the whole battle on one combat. Just send somebody down. Now, by the way, the guy that should have come down was Saul. Saul is Israel's champion, right? He's the tallest guy. He's a head and shoulder. He ought to come down and fight. He's the king. Saul, the Bible says, and all of Israel was in fear and greatly, or dismayed and greatly afraid. The Hebrew word for dismayed means they were broken. Their will to fight had literally left them. They don't want to, they don't want to tangle with this guy. And by the way, if Goliath is that well armed, what might the rest of the army be wearing? What might they be like? And so they're dismayed, and the Bible says they were greatly afraid. The mere sight and sound of this raging giant caused the hearts of the Israelites to grow cold. They were so consumed with fear, they couldn't even move. And so they come to this standoff. And there in this valley, nothing is going on. Kind of reminds me from a history standpoint of what happened in the Civil War. Remember George McClellan? General George McClellan was the the Union uh, uh, general at the beginning of the Civil War. And he had a mass, he massively outnumbered the Confederates on the peninsula of Virginia and could have ended the war with an attack, but he never took it. He was so psyched out, he was so convinced that, that the army of northern Virginia was so much larger and bigger than his, he never came out to fight. He literally built trenches all across the state of Virginia or the peninsula of Virginia and just wouldn't come out to fight. That's what Israel's done. They're just hunkered down, afraid, scared to make a move. Now, by the way, Satan likes to employ that t- tactic against us. He, Satan loves to take our sinful habits and our desires and make them feel overwhelming. I don't know how many times I've talked to somebody who's got a problem, struggling with some particular area of sin, and they'll say this, Pastor, I can't control it. Now, by the way, I totally believe that. I totally accept that you cannot defeat it. But I promise you, there is someone who can. And what happens is Satan likes to make us think there's no hope. The situation is so bad that we can never overcome it. Like Goliath, Satan likes to intimidate us before, and give us to give up before there's even a fight. And so here they are, Israel and the Philistines tied off. But then into this scene comes a, a familiar but a rather unlikely uh, deliverer. Um, Look what happens here in verses 12 through 16. Now David was the son of an Ephraimite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old man, advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the uh, firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and third, Shema. David was the youngest The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward to take his stand morning and evening. Now, I want you to notice what happens here. Introduction to David is very subtle. The writer says, listen, there's this guy named David. And David is the youngest son of Jesse. We already knew that from the previous chapter. But he's not really a part of the main army He does what a lot of Israelites do in that day. And by the way, the Israelites in that day had an all-volunteer army. 
So it was probably quite common for people to spend a few days in the camp of the army and then have to go back and tend their sheep for a couple of days. And so David would go back and forth between the army and his father's home. And, and his father um, uh, is, is finally getting, beginning to get concerned about his brothers who are there the whole time. And so notice what kind of begins to happen here in the next uh, couple of verses. Also, by the way, notice that this standoff has been going on for a month and a half now. People are starting to get worn out. Month and a half. Two armies camped out. No movement. Every day, Goliath comes out, shouts, carries on, stirs up everybody, goes back home, nothing happens. No battle, 40 days. Finally, look what happens in verse number 17. Dave, David is going to be sent with a mission. Now, he's going to start out with a mission from his earthly father, and he's going to end up with a mission from his heavenly father. Look what happens. And Jesse said to David, his son, take your brothers an ephah of a parched grain and 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousands. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now what Jesse is doing here is wanting to provide for his sons. Hey, take some bread. Make sure they've got some bread so they have something to eat over there. Take this cheese and give it to their commander. Why do you think Jesse's dad, by the way, Jesse was sending cheese to the commanders? That was a bribe. Let's try to keep these boys out of the harm's way. Let's make sure they're favorably disposed. Give them a position. He wants to make sure that the commanders know these are his sons and that he's been taking care of them and he's been sending them cheese. And so he, he sends this. Now, here's where it gets interesting. It says, now Saul, uh, in verse 19, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment of the host uh, as the host was going out to battle line, shouting the war cry. I love this. The Israelites, they get all fired up. Every morning, they get fired up. Oh, fight. David arrives just as this is happening. The Israelites are marching out. They're like, we're going to war. We're going to fight the Philistines. We're going to defeat them. Now, they know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's happened for 40 days in a row. They're going to walk out there all fired up, all psyched up, all pumped up. They're going to get out there. Goliath is going to walk out into the middle of the field. He's going to go, boo! And they're all going to run home. It happens every day for 40 days. The same thing has happened over and over, but they're getting fired up. And, and notice what happens. Um, and David left the things in the charge of the keeper, the baggage, and he ran to the ranks, and he went and greeted his brother. He fired up. I'm going to see what my brothers are doing. We're going out to war. And he's just got there in just the right time. He jumps in with the line, marches out. Notice what happens. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. Get the picture. Army of Israel, they're going to do what they always do. They're going to walk up. They're all fired up. Goliath's going to show up. He's going to shout them down. They're going to shrink away in fear. Brothers and sisters, how many times that happened to us? We come to church, we get pumped up, we get fired up, oh, we'll conquer the world. How many of you have ever done this? Had a sinful habit in your life, come to church, get all fired up, I'm going to beat that thing. I'm going to win this battle over pornography. I'm going to win this battle over uh, uh, foul mouth. I'm going to win this battle over this. I'm going to win this battle over that. Come to church, get all fired up, make great resolutions. Monday morning, the temptation comes back out. Unfortunately, the, the temptation looks and feels kind of like Goliath. He goes, you can't defeat me, and we give in and we lose. I say it all the time. We see it all the time. Israel's going to do what they've always done for 40 days in this scene. They're going to shrink away. But then the Bible adds the words. And David heard him. 
if I was making this in the movie, this is where I would put the Rocky Bell. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? In all the Rocky movies, there'll be a moment. That it was great. In the first, in the second Rocky movie is when they first introduced the Rocky Bell. And Rocky has been worried. His wife is dying. He's afraid his child's going to die. And his child is born healthy and his wife comes out of a coma. And, and the only coherent words that Adrian ever speaks in all the Rocky movies, she looks at him and he's, he's not trained. He's not prepared. He's going to get killed by the giant Apollo Creed. And then she looks to him and she says Rocky do something for me and he says what is it Adrian I'll do anything for you and she says win and then in the background you hear boom 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 I promise you every day when I go to when I go to Planet Fitness to work out the song that I put on is that song I sit there in the locker room and I wait for it to come on, sometimes for hours, because I got Pandora and I don't pay for music. And I gotta wait for it to come on. And it comes on and, and I'm sitting there and it's like workout. And it's like bong, bong. And then I get work out. That's what happens right here. David heard it. David, for the first time, hears the giant. But David isn't like the other Israelites. David is a man of faith. And David is a man who understands the promises of God. And it becomes so clear as we move along. By the way, I've lost my place in my notes. Holy cow. All right, let me catch up here. All right, I'm getting so fired up, I don't know what to do. David understands something. The moment he hears the words, look what happens. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. That means they literally turned around and ran. They literally walk out shouting how they're going to win the battle. Goliath comes out and shouts at them, and they run away. What a scene, all right? And they were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills them with great witches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David makes some incredible statements right there. When David looks at this scene, everyone else sees the size of the giant. But David looks at the scene and, and he brings up something important. Who is this man who defies the armies of Israel? He's acknowledging something about that. The army of Israel belonged to God. David is reflecting on the fact that Israel's not alone. Israel's not out there by themselves. The Philistines have a champion, but Israel has an even greater champion. Israel has a, a, a God who will fight on their behalf and be their warrior for him. If they look at the outward scene, they're obviously outmatched. The physical scene looks daunting. It looks hopeless. But the, David doesn't look at it by sight. He sees it through the lens of his theology. And he knows this. This Lord of Israel is a living God. Did you notice there he describes them as the, as the armies of the living God? He's reminding them, our God is not dead. He's not a mute. He's not an a imaginary creature like Dagon, the Philistine God. God's already shown himself to be powerful and mighty throughout this book. And David knows Israel follows the living God. Therefore, there's nothing at all to be afraid of. God is going to fight on the behalf of the Israelites and bring out this victory. Not only that, he knows this. Israel has a covenant with God. God has made a promise to this nation. In fact, by the end of these two books, the first and second Samuel, God is going to give David a promise. And David knows that God is always faithful to his promise. And 
because he doesn't get intimidated by what he sees, instead interprets it through his worldview and his theology and his understanding of his place in, in, in God's plan, David is able to look at this situation radically different. You'll notice what begins to happen. By the way, David's brothers come in the next few verses and try to talk him down. <laughs> David's brothers come and go, what are you doing, man? Keep your mouth shut. Here you are, a teenage boy, and you're out here. You know, stop causing trouble, basically, is what his brother's going to tell him. Shut up. Get back here in the ranks. Keep your mouth quiet. But David keeps going. Verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. Now, by the way, this is not flattering to Saul at all. Saul should be the one going out to fight. By all, by all means, he should be the one going out to fight. He's the king. But Saul is cowering in fear. And he finally hears that there's somebody out there saying, I'll go fight. So he sends for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go out against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but a youth. And he has been a, a man of war from his youth. He said, you're just a teenage kid. This guy's been fighting since, you know, he was a teenager. He's an experienced, well-equipped soldier. What are you possibly thinking? And notice what happens. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and he took the lamb from the flock, I went out after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And, I, and, and, and if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David says, listen, man, I've been experienced. Now, by the way, David may have been talking a little smack of his own right here. <laughs> hey, I went out there, lion comes up to my sheep, grab him by the beard, pow, pow, knock him out. That's what I do. All right? And that's the way this uncircumcised Philistine, by the way, did you notice something? That uncircumcised Philistine is probably an insult, but it's also a theological statement. To be circumcised in that day to mean being in covenant with God. David says, this man does not have the promises of God. He does not belong to God's people. He is an uncircumcised Philistine. And I promise you this, Saul, the, the living God will give me victory. Notice something that David's doing. David is not saying, I will go out there and I'll grab this Philistine and I'll whoop him every way that he can be whooped. That's not what David is saying. David's not saying he can defeat Goliath. He's saying, God can defeat Goliath. He's fighting not out of his own strength and his own power. He's fighting because God is going to send him as his representative. All right? And, and so you notice there the faith that, that, that David expresses. Everyone around him telling him he's crazy, cannot possibly prevail. David is going to be faithful to the things that God has told him. Now, be careful. What we like to make this about is us overcoming enormous odds. But as I've been trying to emphasize to you, David's not the hero of the story. This is not a story about how you can overcome big odds in your life. This is a story about how God works and it sets a model for the gospel. David is simply taking what he hears and what he sees, he's filtering it through his understanding of Scripture, and then he's living in accordance with that. All right? So we move on in verses 38 through 40. And uh, by the way, I only have one point in this sermon. I'm going to tell you right at the end. It'll be the last thing I'll tell you, and then we're done. All right, but, but let me say this too. In verse 38 through 40, we begin to see sort of the development of this. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. This is great. Saul says, okay, David, you're going to need some protection. Let me put my armor on you. By the way, Israelite armor wasn't that great. Okay, but he's going to put him on it, give him his best shot. And, and so he clothes him in all of his armor. He puts a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped his sword over his armor. He tried in vain to go, for he had not, te uh, uh, t for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. David says, listen, he's just encumbered with me. These ain't going to work. I don't know how to use these. But basically what I have not tested them means, means I don't know how to use these. These don't work for me. All right? So instead, notice what happens in verse number 39. 
Um, then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. So David put them off, verse 40. And then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. And his sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. He goes down to the brook and he gets five stones. Now I gotta talk about these stones for a minute. Some people have suggested, based on some other passages in the Bible, that this was because Saul or that Goliath had four brothers. That's not clear from Scripture. There are four giants mentioned in other parts of the Bible, uh, but uh, it's not clear that Goliath had. The Bible never says that these were Goliath's brothers, nor that he had four brothers. It's possible that he did, but it's not. It's not, it's not proven. More than likely, David was being prudent. <laughs> David knew, I, got, I, got, I don't have very many shots here. He, he puts five rocks. Now, by the way, these were not little pebbles. These rocks are about the size, most scholars estimate, the slings that were used by Israel in that day shot out a, a projectile that was about the size of a softball. We know that because we have some of these, these slingshots that they use. These were big rocks that he's, he got, he's got softball-sized rocks that he's putting in his pouch along with a slingshot, and that's what he's going to go out to battle with, all right? Why? Because he, that's what he's used before. Let me say this to you. There's nothing significant at all about the weaponry. He could have taken a stick out there, and he still would have win, won, beat Goliath. He could have went out there, and hurled butterflies at him. And he still won this battle. It's not the weapon that defeated Goliath. That's just part of the story. That's just part of what's going on here. Look what happens in verse 41. The Philistine moved forward. He came near to David. He's marching out. By the way, notice that Goliath has another advantage. With his shield bearer in front of him. <laughs> So, so David's really not after two guys. He's got Goliath, and he's, Goliath's got a shield bearer out there that's holding his shield out in front of him, trying to block these projectiles and trying to protect Goliath. Notice what, what happens in verse 42. When the Philistine looked and he saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. I imagine that this probably irritated the hound out of Goliath. Goliath wants a champion. He wants somebody to fight He's thinking Saul's coming out. He's thinking one of the great warriors of Israel's coming out. He looks down, and there's Garrett Lang. You got what I'm saying? Little guy, ruddy, red-headed, good-looking fella. But Goliath is like, what in the world are they sending this guy out to fight me? And, and so look what he does. The Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Notice the theological nature of this. He comes out and, and, and he says, am I a dog that you come out to me with this? And then he begins to curse David by the gods of the Philistines. He's calling upon Dagon and Baal and all the other Philistine gods to destroy David. Notice what happens in verse 44. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. That's a statement of faith. David walks out, and Goliath is basically saying, I'm going to defeat you. My gods are going to defeat you. You have no power against me. And David comes out and says, listen, man, I haven't come out here in the power of David. I haven't come out here. I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord of God. And, and notice all of the descriptions. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of the armies of Israel. And this day, he's going to give you into my hand. David is careful to understand this battle is not his. This is God's battle. This is the battle that God is going to win on his, on his behalf. And so, again, what happens? Our enemy tries to intimidate us. Goliath does everything he can do to, 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 to discourage David and, and to get him away. But David understands there's something at stake in this battle and notice what he says in the next part. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And, 
Did you notice the purpose of this battle? This is an evangelistic battle. David says, when this whole battle is over, everybody's going to know there is a God in Israel. Everybody's going to know who this God is. In other words, David's saying, when this is all said and done, I don't want you to remember David fought Goliath. I want you to remember that God defeated Baal. I want you to know that God defeated the gods of the Philistines. I want you to know that there is a God in Israel who is faithful to his covenant and takes care of his promises and protects his people. This is about God. And so notice what happens. When the Philistine rose and he came and he drew near to David, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. He doesn't go back. He runs right at the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it. And he struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and he stood over the Philistine and he took his sword and he drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that the champion was dead, they fled. We're going to stop there, but I want you to see what begins to happen here. David comes out, and when the battle finally comes on, he runs to the battle. He grabs his rock. He throws it into his slingshot, and he hurls it at the the giant. Now, most translations have this, that he hit him in the forehead. And that... That's very possible that he hit him in the forehead. The word here for forehead, though, is rather complicated. It's a Hebrew word that earlier in that passage is the exact same word to describe the coverings on Goliath's legs. It's the same Hebrew word. The problem was the Hebrews didn't have really a good word for this forehead area. So they they use, or, or I'm sorry, for the armor. So when they described those armor pieces, they used pieces. And they said this was kind of like the front piece for his leg. And some scholars believe that what David actually did was run up and he threw it and he hit him in the leg, probably in the knee. Now, that makes sense according to this text. Can we sit down in here and have a Bible study for just a moment? Makes sense. What direction did Goliath fall? The closest thing I have to Goliath is Big Mike. Big Mike is a big man. If, if Big Mike was coming at me and I took a slingshot with a rock about that size and I hurled it at Mike and I hit him in the forehead, what direction would Mike fall? He would fall, what, forward? Boom, backwards. Now, we're not going to attempt that because I'm afraid I couldn't sling it and I wouldn't hit Mike and then Mike could catch me. If Mike catches me, it's all over. But what would happen if Mike was coming at me and I took my slingshot and I hit him in the knee with a soft paw-sized rock? Boom, forward. And did you notice something? The rock didn't kill him. David comes up and he grabs Goliath's own sword and he cuts Goliath's head off, by the way, which was the Israelite punishment for blasphemy. So he wins this battle. And I tell you all of that, just to simply say this. No matter where he hit him, forehead, leg, ankle, pinky toe, it didn't matter because God was winning this battle. See, here's the real picture. We have to stop and remember who David is. David is the great, 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 so many times removed. Actually, I have it in my notes. I think it's 40, 30 generations, 20 generations, something like that. Several generations room from Jesus. He's the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus, and he's a great picture of the gospel. See, here's what we like to do. When we read the story, we all want to be David. How many of you want to be David? Right? We all want to be David, right? Who are we really? We're Israel. <laughs> We're the people sitting there cowering in fear, intimidated by our enemy, broken in our sin. Where is Israel? We come out, oh, we talk a good talk every day. I'm going to win this battle today, buddy. I tell you, I ain't going to sin today. 
I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to do it all right. And we get all fired up. We meet the enemy somewhere. If you get up about 7 o'clock in the morning, you meet the enemy somewhere about 30 seconds later. Y'all understand? And then we get intimidated and we get broke and we give up and we run away just like the Israelites did. But thank God. One day a champion arose. And his name was Jesus. And just like his great, 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 great grandfather who took the place of the nation of Israel and become their representatives in a battle they could not hope to have won and a battle they could not have physically won on their own behalf, David went out and he stood in the place and he won the victory by the power of God. But one day Jesus went to the cross And he took your place and he defeated an enemy that you could not beat. Sin, death, hell. We couldn't defeat those things. We couldn't defeat Satan on our behalf. We couldn't defeat our own sinful natures on our behalf. But Jesus went to the cross and he took our punishment. See, that's the picture. This is a picture of what Jesus would later do on our behalf. And so it's not a story for us to go I'm going to try to be more like David in my life. It's a story to say, I need God to win the victory in my life. I need to come and trust in Jesus, my champion and my savior and my deliverer every single day of my life. And that starts at the moment of our salvation. But brothers and sisters, it continues every day therefore. Every day. We have to come out. And the enemy likes to tell you after you're saved, you can't do it. No, you're right. I can't do it. I was sitting there this morning getting ready to preach. And you know, I'm just going to tell you, this is a big Sunday for me. This is a big Sunday. My much older sister is here today. We've helped her into the building. We've, we wheeled her in. Diane is back there, my sister and brother-in-law. She's embarrassed. The person who looks most embarrassed in the church today is my much older sister. I can't help but to emphasize that. She's much older than me. You won't believe that when you see her. You're going to look and go, no way is she younger than older than you. She is. So I was all fired up. I got to preach a good sermon this morning. And you know what Satan starts doing? You can't do that. You're so stupid. You ain't going to be able to preach that sermon. You know you don't know anything about David and Goliath. You know you, you, know you ain't going to press anybody. And you know the good news is, he's right. I can't do any of those things. But God can. Amen? And Satan likes to come to you and he likes to whisper you. I'm gonna just be, can we just be honest for a moment? Some of you went to homecoming this week, last night, and you did stupid stuff. Oh, I know. I talk to God. I know these things. Some of you actually, and I, I promise you, some of you won't look at me right now because you know I'm talking about you. You're like, oh, I've been defeated and I've been broken up. And Satan comes and he wars against us. But I got good news for you. The battle doesn't belong to you anyways. Trust Jesus. Amen. Some of you are sitting here going, oh, pastor, I don't know if I could go out and serve God the way I'm supposed to. I got good news for you. You don't have to. Jesus will do it through you. But you've got to trust him. He is our deliverer. He is our champion. He is the man who stands between us and God. And he makes intercession every day on our behalf. Amen? So that we can have victory. Let's stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to hear your word, Father, to preach your word. Lord, I pray today that beyond anything else, Father, that Jesus be magnified. I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that has come into this room trying hard to earn their salvation, but falling short. Lord, I pray today that they will recognize that, Lord, there is a Savior who loves them, who stood in their place on the cross, gave his life so that they could have forgiveness of sin and eternal life. 
Lord, I pray today that they might turn and they might trust him. I pray today if there's anyone facing a battle of sin and discouragement and disappointment, Lord, even as a believer, we have those moments in our life to know that, Lord, we can't beat the enemy. We're like Israel, but we have a Savior who's already beat him on our behalf. And Lord, to put our faith and our trust in him. Lord, I pray today that your will be done. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, guide and lead this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.